What's good, folks? Welcome to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, the show that gives you the hows and the whys behind the good and the bad of the Buffalo Bills. I am one of your two hosts, Anthony Prohaska, joined as always by Eric Turner. And Eric, it's playoff time, survive <laughs> and advance, and that is what the Buffalo Bills did in the wild card round against the Pittsburgh Steelers and have moved on to potentially slay their postseason dragon this week in the divisional round Boy. against the Kansas City Chiefs. I know it's just I'm not, so I, I'm not even ready. I'm not even ready. <laughs> it's so man, the, the the amount of poetic and potential storybook moments for this team this year and how things have lined up. It, it's funny how these puzzle pieces are kind of fitting into place. And speaking of puzzle pieces, there were several that fit into place against the Steelers that were out of place against the Steelers and they had to find new pieces to fit. There was a lot of, uh, you know, chaos at certain points in this game. But at the end of the day, the Bills come away with a uh, a pretty strong victory, some solid performances on both sides of the ball schematically yeah. and individually. And we're here to break down a lot of those pieces in the film room tonight. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this film room and things that we're going to cover. But can we just stop, take a breath and appreciate the Bills being in the playoffs. You know, there are a lot of teams and there are a lot of fan bases that wish they were in this position. And, you know, not a year goes by after those 17 years, not a year goes by that I have not appreciated watching this team play, watching Josh Allen, you know, the Wild Stallion play uh, for this team, for our team. And so just take a minute, you know, let it let it sink in for a minute before we move on to the Chiefs. Obviously, we got to go back and look at the Steelers game. So, you know, it's going to be fun. We're going to cover... You know, how the Bills slowed down the Steelers' run game, which was talked about leading into this, the physicality of that offense and that offensive line and the running backs, really good running back duo in, in Harris and Warren. Um, and we're going to talk about the Bills' run game, James Cook, and how sneaky good it was and how, you know, Cook really set up some of his uh, blocks and, and again, kind of just hit some of those creases and used his vision to, um, you know, stay ahead of the chain, stay ahead of schedule. And then, of course, we got to get to JA. We got to talk about... Josh Allen and how he really was the triple threat, you know, winning the game with his arm, with his legs and fake also, slides and his fake slides. Yeah. You know, just fooling everybody. Um, and then just winning from the shoulders up, which is something that, you know, he's going to have to do this weekend against the chiefs and the defensive coordinator, the chiefs Spagnolo. So a lot to cover tonight. So grab your beverages, you know, sit down, uh, enjoy. We're going to go through some films, some analytics as we always do. And, uh, recap this win against the Steelers. That's a, you know, you hit a good point of like appreciating the bills being in the playoffs. And I, th I think I said it either somebody in real life or on disguise coverage last week. I can't remember everything. It's been a blur this like past year in <laughs> these past like months and ever since the holiday, I just feel like I'm in a blender, but going into that week 18 game against Miami and having to watch, you know, I'm, we're watching football all the time, but watching that Steelers game on Saturday, knowing like, okay, we need them to lose for the Bills to clinch. And then watching that Jags game to be like, okay, we need them to lose to clinch. Like, I had forgotten what that had felt like the past several years. Like, I'm used to week 18 just being like, well, the Bills have already won the division. Or it's like, the Bills have clinched. What seed are they going to get? Like, I had forgotten what it was like to not have the Bills in the playoffs. And that's just such a wild thing considering – how we grew up, what we've been through, the drought, the fact that we're in a situation where it, it should be almost a given for the Bills to w be in the playoffs every year, but even more so probably win the division every year. Yeah, just it, it's funny how quickly we've gone from just being appreciative yeah. as a fan base to being like, this isn't good enough. They should be this and they should be that. And how come they haven't clinched by, you know, week four? And it's like, that's not mathematically possible. It's like, doesn't matter. They're falling below expectations. Yeah, it, it's it's funny how, how quick of a turnaround it's been. And, you know, this is a team again, like you said, they wins the division for the fourth year in a row and they get that home game to start out a, a wild card weekend. And against the Steeler team that it seems like no matter what, no matter who their quarterback is or what their roster is every year, the Steelers team just feels like they are just reincarnations of mm -hmm. previous Steeler teams. They play fast. They play physical. They try to slow down the game and muddy up the game. They want to run the football. They're going to blitz. They're going to attack. They want to play on that front foot. They do a really good job of almost sucking you into their way of playing football. Right. And this game got into that at certain points, but the Bills were able to weather the storm on both sides of the ball. Then the run games loomed large, like you said, course right. correcting for that, um, really controlling the Steeler run game on defense, the Bills able to move the ball offensively, and that defensive side that helped control that Steeler run game. You talked about the um, 
you know, the, the defensive line and the play they have, but the bills also had a multitude of injuries that happened in this game. They had dudes coming off the bench and out of nowhere to step up. It really was a collective effort both on the field and off the field on both sides of the ball, but especially defensively given that they were looking like a mash unit at certain points in that game. Yeah. I thought the bills controlled the game for the most part. And that was kind of aided by them getting off to that hot start and getting up, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, several touchdowns. And that kind of put the Steelers out of their initial game script. They're not built to come back like that. They're just, they Mm -hmm. just don't have the horses, especially um, on the offensive side of the ball. That's not the type of game that they wanted to play from behind. So for me as a fan, I wasn't truly worried. Even, even when that momentum swing happened with that, you know, blocked field goal, I wasn't all too worried that they were going to come back and, and win the game. Um, but I agree. I, I think the the biggest issue I had with this game was the injuries, man. And the injuries were on the defensive side of the ball. The, and, and they've they've had injuries there all year. And we've given kudos to McDermott and that staff and how they have been able to reinvent themselves and, you know, kind of scheme up some things to, um, you know, to affect the quarterback, to slow down run games. And, Man, it, it would just be terrible to see them go forward against the Chiefs with some of the injuries that that you know that they have uh, seen the last week or two weeks. You know, when you're talking about Rasul Douglas, you know Terrell Bernard, guys like that, big names. I mean, some of the guys that they had in there were just it was unreal to even think of that they're playing those type of snaps. But in the end, again, when you play a team like the Steelers, they didn't quite have the firepower on the offensive mm-hmm. offensive side of the ball, and they didn't quite have the scheme. Like the scheme of the Bills defense, McDermott was still throwing those curveballs and changeups and keeping Mason Rudolph, uh, you know, off off balance and off guard pre to post snap. And, you know, some of those things we'll talk about later. But I I've, I think that was the worst case scenario, you know, them getting ahead and getting the Steelers off, you know, off of their script and, and strategy. Mm-hmm. But then those injuries hitting when, you know, the game was kind of under control. But that momentum swing in that second to third quarter did you know, strike fear into some Bills fans. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think you you put it a good, you know, you put it in a really good way with the game script piece. Like this Steelers, and I, I said it going into the game, like just don't let the Steelers run the football and don't turn the ball over and you're probably going to win this game. Like that's it. Like just play simple, clean football. That's it. You are better from a schematic standpoint and a roster standpoint versus the Steelers team. And the game script really swung hard against the Steelers early. They They go down. Seven nothing, and then you get the Pickens fumble on mm-hmm. the sideline that puts the Bills in positive in a positive start. They should have had another turnover with uh, the Benford force fumble on Fryermuth. I yeah. I still don't get how it wasn't Bills ball. It looked like Specter recovered it before he touched out of bounds, and I know the broadcast was trying to make it like, did the ball glance off a of Fryermuth's mm-hmm. helmet while he was touching out of bounds? We never really got clear. Yeah, there uh, was an explanation. No, truly on that, and yeah. I really thought with the review especially once Gene Steratore were like on the broadcast was like, yeah, this is a clear recovery. This will be Bill's ball. And mm-hmm. when they stuck with it, I was like, huh? But it, regardless, yeah. that could have pushed the pendulum even further mm-hmm. against the Steelers. And yeah, this was not a team that wants to put the ball in Mason Rudolph's hands and right. sling it around the park and just do everything they can through the air. They want to make it money. They want to make it dirty. And that game script, like you said, didn't allow it to happen. And, It's a shame coming out of a game like this with injuries. And I I was really dejected after the Bills victory against Miami earlier in the year with the Trey White news Mm -hmm. uh, or with the injury of what we thought was going to happen. And this one a little bit as well. You know, Bernard has been so important in watching him go down and just having anytime a dude gets carted off and keeps the towel over their face yeah. is just immediately I'm like okay he's crying worst he's case. upset yep and that's what you know, exactly worst case scenario and mm-hmm. I'm like that's injury on top of all the under other injuries there was one point where Leonard Floyd got up slowly and mm-hmm. went to the sideline and was doing this and I was like oh no like yeah. and that was that's really that worst case scenario like where you do advance but you're so banged up where you're you're just at such a disadvantage and of course potentially being at a disadvantage against the Kansas city chiefs who are coming in relatively healthy. And it just that you juxtapose those two things. And it's so frustrating, but silver lining and to kind of put a nice little bow on it was they did suffer those injuries, but multiple guys stepped up and having to fill those spots, guys that were not expected to have big roles in this game. We saw multiple players stand out. I know Eric, you had one that you wanted to speak to. I have one as well. You know, who's somebody that really stepped up for you and was a defensive standout in this game. Yeah, and before we start naming those guys, you know, let us know who you guys thought as far as depth player goes, guys that came in 
because of injured players. Let us know in the chat who you thought stood out. For me, it had to be Kair Elam. Like it mm -hmm. was a roller coaster, right? And has been for yeah. him since he's coming to the league. Obviously, we've had him here in the film room. We've broken down film with him. We've gushed about how intelligent he is. And in this game, it started out rough, kind Real of bad. just like, like his <laughs> career, right? He gets trucked on third down after dropping out into his zone. He gets trucked for the first down. Uh, he has that penalty in the red zone. Real but then just grabs yeah, Deontay Johnson. The mental toughness, though, from that point on, especially when you're talking about the interception, how they're in the low red zone, and the Bills come out, and they play man coverage, but they play in a way where – the two inside receivers, the slot receivers are doubled. This is something they do a bunch of. They double the inside guys, and they tell the outside corners, hey, you're on an island, play with good leverage, play with good technique. We're going to leave you guys on an island. And that's exactly what they did on that play, on that interception. He took inside leverage. He damn near ran the route with Johnson there, and then he got his head around and intercepted. That was a big play. And, you know, it's complimentary football because he takes it away there in the red zone, so that's taking points away from the Steelers, but more importantly, the Bills drive it all the way down there and get points for themselves. So I thought his mental toughness has been really probably one of his stronger traits since coming in the league, especially with the way his career has unfolded. And so mm -hmm. I got to give him props there because it was a rough start to that game, but he hung in there and he came out and made a play in a tech with technique and coverage skills that, you know, again, were his strengths coming out of Florida. And then even as the game progressed, he had several really nice coverage reps throughout the rest of the game. He had a couple of nice man, reps. Two man support. reps were on point where he's in trail tech. Like he looked yes. really good. And that's even, that was the one thing when Benford was out, I was like, you know what? They've been playing more two man. This could work for yeah. Kyrie. And I'm like, okay. And then as soon as I'm thinking that, like you said, he gets struck by Friar Booth yeah. and then grabs Deontay Johnson, almost horse collars him. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. But that mental toughness that you spoke to, that is so perfect. Like it is such a hard thing to come off the bench. You're basically like a pinch hitter, like in baseball, coming off the bench cold, and you'd have to be inserted the game and hit the ground running. And his ability to adjust in this game and make plays, make a splash play with that interception, like you said, with really good technique, like that one is such a good encapsulation of what he can be with his mm -hmm. length and athleticism and physicality, but not being too grabby and drawing the flag. And he just turns his head and the ball's gift wrap to him right there. Yeah. And for him to step up and play in that moment, down Rasul Douglas. He should have had another one. He should have had the other one on yeah, the sideline too. Later, Pickens falls thinking. down. Yeah. And then he, he, and I, I rewound it a bunch. You could see it on the broadcast too. When he goes to put that first plant foot down, mm -hmm. he steps on Pickens' ankle. And I think that throws his whole body off right. kilter. But yeah, I was like, is he going to get two? Is he going to get I another? Know. And then maybe he plays this weekend. We've already seen him intercept Patrick Mahomes once, like he did last year mm -hmm. in Kansas City. Yeah, he stepped up big. And again, that's a position group that has been decimated. Trey White goes down and Rasul Douglas is down in this game. Then Benford goes down and you're playing with, you know, Dane Jackson and Kyrie. Let you know, we've seen Dane step up before too. I want to give a yeah, little shout out to did. Dane Jackson well. for con continuing to, um, you know, get some help from the referees as George Pickens would say, but him continuing to step up. And as you are bringing up a bunch of the comments there in the chat, yeah. um, I love <laughs> your pick with Kyrie. I'm going to go with AJ Klein just because, you know, Alex Brasky, our boy, yeah. Over there, uh, you know, as the editor for Batavia Daily and everything he does for Bill's Digest, he had that quote from Klein after the game saying that he was just at home with his family in Charlotte <laughs> and was gonna like was planning a vacation and to then the, keys. the Bills called. <laughs> yeah, to the, like can it is the blizzard the, or the keys? Right? Like, <laughs> which do I pick? Oh, it's the blizzard. It's so we get caught up so much in not necessarily us, but I think like the like fans. And sure. talking about football players and being like, oh, this guy sucks. And this guy's this. And like, oh, this guy's a third string linebacker. He sucks. But that third string linebacker is better at football than you can even comprehend. And mm -hmm. it is an elite fraternity to make it into the NFL and stay into the NFL. It's very hard. And the fact that AJ Klein basically came off of his couch and stopped vacation prepping to come play football. And granted, he wasn't supposed to play in this game. And he comes in, and from his very first rep when he was playing with Bernard, he's he's it was beautiful. Him, yeah. he's communicating to Bernard. Bernard's communicating to him. They're both going back and forth, and that's what Klein gives you. Like we all know what he is. He's long in the tooth. He's got mileage on the tires. He's not what he used to be in coverage. That is not his strong suit. But his ability to play football from the neck up, his ability to come forward and play with physicality. He's such a smart and cerebral player. Mm -hmm. 
And to just see him, yeah, like literally come off the couch, bro. Bruce Nolan had a great um, line on Twitter saying from the couch to the green dot. And that's what it was like. He literally <laughs> yeah. left the couch and is all of a sudden the signal caller. Once Bernard goes down, he's communicating to Hyde and Poyer and then Terrence played Johnson both goes. linebacker positions yes. and yes. then the dot and call. And, and honestly, <laughs> you know, once he got the green dot, when Bernard went out, that probably that right there is probably his biggest contribution. You can say he had all these tackles, but honestly being, you know, the, the play caller on defense, they're taking over that green dot. Mm -hmm. next to specter and then dorian williams like mm -hmm. i think that may have been his biggest contribution absolutely uh, that and that doesn't show in the box score like that type of preparation like you said and experience is is valuable it's valuable and yes he's right off the couch and he had you know a family vacation planned <laughs> it, it all that doesn't matter you know he knows this defense like the back of his hand so much so he played both linebacker positions and then took over as a play caller like you can't stress how valuable that is to um, the general manager, Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, the, the head coach and D coordinator. Absolutely. Like to have, to just be able to have that sort of reliability in a player that you're like plugging in, in an emergency situation, knowing that he can get everybody right and set and communicate to people. And, um, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that linebacker grouping going forward. Obviously he's not somebody you want living in space, um, against the Kansas city chiefs. Yeah. I, I do tell you something though, if he does play against the Kansas city chiefs, I do like the idea of seeing him meet Isaiah Pacheco in the hole because Klein is still a hammer coming forward for as mm -hmm. limited in space as he is. But yeah, for, for him to step up for Kyrie to step up, multiple players stepping up in this game for they the did. Buffalo bills. And, um, you know, the run defense stepped up as well. Something sure that you did. alluded to in this intro. And a lot of it was due to, we, we talk about it a bunch on the show. We've talked about it when we've had Daquan Jones on and Greg Rousseau. I usually always make it a point to try and ask one of these players, about the everybody doing their 111th when it comes to run defense because yeah. how run fits work, it is such a orchestrated, choreographed dance at times with everybody mm -hmm. having to fulfill their duty and responsibility. And I think a lot of fans don't get that and understand that. And we saw that a lot in this game with everybody doing their job, making things easier for the back end and for the linebackers. And a lot of that ease came from the play of the defensive line and in particular the interior defensive linemen in this game really shining. Yeah, they did. Uh, you, you're going to see some of the film of the run defense defense against the bills they held warren and harris to 20 designed rushes for 75 yards uh, they played with really good gap integrity you know daquan linval joseph tim settle like the d tackles in this game and i'm not going to leave out at oliver but the other three that i mentioned uh they really held their ground against a physical downhill type run attack of the steelers and it allowed the guys at the second level regardless of who was back there to play downhill to fire into their gaps. And like you said, the choreography, as you'll see in the film, you'll see that they're playing off each other. And we've been mentioning these guys the last few weeks. And honestly, they've been propelling this defense and really been the engine of this defense the last few weeks or the back half of this season. You know, even guys like Puna, who didn't play in this game, you know, when he did play, you saw him making plays over the last couple of weeks. So I think the D tackles, when we get to the film, guys, pay attention to the D tackles and then pay attention to who was behind them at the linebacker position, because regardless of who was, you saw them at the first level, setting the line of scrimmage and resetting the line of scrimmage in their favor against the Steeler. It's such an important part of run defense. And when you think about, this isn't anything, this isn't to take anything away from really good off ball linebackers in today's NFL, but a lot of off ball linebackers that succeed, think about the Fred Warners and the Roquan Smiths, and then think about who plays in front of them in those defenses. Those defensive lines cause havoc and chaos and eat up blockers and allow those dudes to play free. Mm -hmm. And I was a little disappointed that Puna wasn't able to go in this game. And I know you and I, um, haven't been the most over the moon with Limbaugh Joseph's play, but yeah, he held his own. In he this stood game out. He yes, stood out this game. He did. Props and to Tim, him. Tim settle for as much as we raked him over the coals in the off season, off season and yeah. his performance last year down the stretch, really since I don't know, week 12 ish, 13, he's gotten better every single week. He's holding his own versus the run. He's versus flashing. the run is what's yes. really the thing that stood out too. Cause when we got him last, uh, the prior off season, we were like, okay, we can use him at nose tackle, zero tech. And we were thinking about his pass rush element, but his run defense has actually improved since the, the first year he was with the Bills. He's dropping the knee and splitting double mm -hmm. teams. Like, and when you have your depth guys doing that, in addition to what Daquan Jones is and what Ed Oliver is, and then you can put in a Limbaugh Joseph or a Puna Ford and Tim Settle and have that impact 
Also, you know, we know what Jordan Phillips offers and also mm-hmm. what he doesn't, but Phillips has been banged up. So there's even more depth being tested. And in a game like this, where you were facing a team that wanted to just run right at you and shorten the game and make life easy, the Bills interior and defense as a whole, but especially that D line and that interior, they made life difficult for the Steelers. And this play you have queued up is literally the first play of the game. And when I saw this, I was like, this is going to be a good day mm-hmm. with what Russo and Oliver did. And it kind of set the tone a little bit. Yeah, and so Rudolph checked to this play first quarter. The ball's at the 30-yard line, first and 10 play, a one-yard gain. So watch Ed Oliver and watch Rousseau and that that dance, that choreography. Initially, you see Oliver spike inside, and Sumalo reaches him. But mm. then watch Oliver work over the top. Look at Rousseau set that edge, and then just look how they play off each other. And Oliver works down the line of scrimmage. You see Rousseau squeeze, disengage from a really good tight end, uh, tight end there mm-hmm. in Washington as a good blocker, right? Uh, mm-hmm. He disengages and makes the tackle there. But again, that dance, watch Oliver, watch Daquan Jones, you know, in that backside a gap and then watch Bernard and Bernard's even playing off of Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver. You see Ed Oliver's initially right here. This is Daquan. So Bernard's reading that. And then the flow of the play, watch him fall back as those guys all get down the line of scrimmage. And he says, you know what? I'm going to trust them. And I'm just going to stay on the backside. That's gap integrity. And that's processing the play and trusting that your teammates are going to do their job. And that's exactly what it is. Everybody has to do their job. If you have two players in the same gap, you can get gouged. And we've seen that happen from time to time with the bills and this play. Yeah. Like, 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 like you said, just the, the dance, the choreography, the integrity for me, it really starts with Greg Rousseau. Like you see, we talk about it so much with him, his run defending ability, Mm -hmm. but the length really shows up for him as a run defender. We, everybody's always talked about, man, like what can you do as a pass rusher with that length? But he uses his length so much against the run. You highlighted his base there. He's got his feet underneath him. He's using that long arm. He's keeping Darnell Washington at bay and reading the track of Mm -hmm. Najee Harris. So he's controlling his gap on the outside, sees Harris goes in and just confidently dips inside, trips up Harris Ed Oliver finishes it. It's just a really great play from Greg Rousseau, who, you know, you've talked about him a bunch. You've done videos on it. He truly is one of the elite edge defending or uh, run defending edges in yeah. the entire NFL. Even, even this year with how banged up he's been, his run defense production never suffers. And it's something that I don't think anybody really kind of projected for his game with how raw he was coming out of Miami. He truly is one of the best run defending edges in football. Yeah, here's another play. First quarter, this is a two-yard gain from Harris on first and 10. And the Bills have the uh, the defense stacked there in the box, and this is just a nice play from Daquan Jones. Watch him against Mason Cole, who the center, Mason Cole, he was terrible. <laughs> he had a rough game. I'm sorry, he was terrible. Look at Daquan play into him, reset that line of scrimmage, knock him back. I mean, look where the ball snapped from, and then look at the knockback and how he disengages right there and makes the tackle on Harris, along with, uh, Spectre, too. You, yes. you kind of lose it on this angle, but watch Spectre right here. Watch him work through the traffic, then go grab the legs on the backside of this cut. Uh, good work by him as well, but another good run fit here and run defense by the Bills' interior defensive line. He nailed it with it. It's starting with Daquan Jones. Like he knocks him back almost like a full two yards off the ball, and he does it with, you know, he's pointed at him and tilted towards him from the snap, but he goes in, he knocks him back so far. <laughs> And then he hits him with his left arm. And then he, he, (laughs) I feel so bad because we just keep rewinding it. Look at the extension for Daquan. The extension is so legit that he's, he's easily able to one arm in it. Yes. (laughs) He's one arm in it. And then he brings his right arm through and just sheds him. And is like, all right, forget you. Let me go make the tackle and jumps onto Najee's back. Like uh, just we missed that so much on the interior this year. And the other guys have held their own, but Daquan just brings another level to it. And yeah, shout out to Spectre playing through a really good guard mm-hmm. in Sayamalu who came over from Philly yeah. last year. He's had a good year from Pittsburgh. And for Spectre to be able to play through his shoulder and make a physical play, that's a good rep for him. Here's another good rep from Bernard. It's a three-yard gain uh, on a run by Harris. First quarter, uh, Pittsburgh 28-yard line, second and seven situation. And, you know, Bernard works in traffic, but this is another one of those reps. Uh, where the interior defensive lineman, specifically Joseph on this play, watch Joseph, watch Shaq Lawson and how they squeeze and compress this, this gap right here. You get this pull right here. They're trying to uh, create that entry point for the running back and Linval Joseph on the backside, he compresses, look at Shaq on the front side. And then just Bernard, just sifting through the traffic, 
ripping through that that block right there, and then you'll see him on the tail end of that kind of grab the legs of the running back right there. But this starts inside. This starts with Joseph. It starts with uh, Shaq compressing the edge and against this gap run. Just good, again, choreographed run fits and gap integrity by the Bills defense. And Linval Joseph and Shaq Lawson squeezing that gap Watch the hesitation it causes for Sayamalu number 73. He's like coming through trying to pull, but he's it's almost like he's doing like the trying to do like the pick up his feet footwork drill in practice yeah. because he has to step over his men. So he loses momentum as he comes through the hole, which helps Spectre stick him and close that gap. And then you said Bernard yeah. goes through Broderick Jones trying to climb to the second level. We saw so much of these kind of reps in this game where the interior was just muddy and it was dirty. And that's all you need. Run fits don't have to be the prettiest or the cleanest. Just gum up the works, make things dirty and hard and difficult on the inside for an offense. And that's what the Bills interior did time and time again, especially against Najee Harris, who he's not the most shifty back who's going to be setting up all these holes. So if you can clog the lane and he doesn't have anywhere to go, you can stop him before he gets started. Right, so watch this one. Rousseau, Spectre, and Bernard here. This is a one-yard gain from Warren up the middle. Just, again, working through the gaps mm. and, you know, creating disruption. Watch Spectre and Bernard. So you get this guy coming across the formation here, and you got obviously some split flow right here as well. But watch Bernard work across. So they have to bump over these gaps with that tight end, our number 83, coming across the formation. And Bernard hits the gap. He hits this one, and, and Spectre does too. And, and Bernard's <laughs> like, dude, you're, not, you're in the wrong gap. Get in the other gap, and you'll Get see. Watch, yeah, watch Spectre work over the top here. But again, the disruption by Bernard forces that cutback. Ed Oliver on this side forces that cutback. Again, all working together. Disruption right there from Bernard. And then guess who's there to make the tackle? You have Spectre and Rousseau on the backside of that run. Just, again, great teamwork. Great run fits and disruption and chaos at the line of scrimmage, not letting these talented running backs get going. They're hitting them at or near the line of scrimmage and just not allowing them to get to that second level. Bernard's processing and triggering has been, we, we see it so much. It makes me sad to watch him make this play. Cause I'm like, Oh, I really hope you can play somehow this Sunday. Just his trigger and di ability to diagnose and ID what's happening and be able to connect the mental with the physical. It, it's been such a bonus for him this year. And you highlight him there. Um, he's got his eyes on 83 Hayward, that tight end. And as soon as he sees him flash, he sees he that flash going. Man, exactly. He knows where it's going. Like he doesn't even look to see, no, okay, where's the gap? He immediately gets to that a gap and he shoots it and helps break up this play. But it, the you highlighting specter is also something that I love as Linval Joseph eats up again, a center yeah, and that left guard. Exactly Cole, Cole and Sumalo are working to Bernard. All right, again, Spectre's supposed to be over here. So they're working to Bernard, but look how quickly Bernard triggers, to your point, and gets through that. Like, Cole can't even get to him. He can't even pick him off as he shoots that gap. And then Linval's able to just sit there and gum up the works. And your highlight of Spectre is really nice, too. Like, rather than just sit there and be in the wrong gap, Spectre is like, oh, okay, let me flow over the top and then fit in here. And that's just a good adjustment on the fly from Baylen Specter from a guy who has not really seen starters minutes, probably doesn't get a ton of reps in practice either. Like he's way down the depth chart. That's a nice adjustment on the fly playing off of Bernard. Like he said, and that's, th this is also too, I think it's, we, and we haven't talked about him enough. Like we probably should highlight Bobby Babbage like every single week for what yeah. the linebackers have done there this year with, we know what Milano is, you know, he took over the linebackers last year and Milano gets an all pro now, but with what Bernard has done this year, Tyrell Dodson has taken a jump in this game. And then to see the flashes yeah. here from Spectre and what they've been able to do with these guys, Dorian Williams has had some struggles, but had some flashes as well. Like you don't get this, this quality and this assimilation of guys coming in. If that position coach isn't on point. Right, and so here, Daquan is on the weak side of the formation here. He's in that one tech, that that shade nose tackle position. I want you to watch him and how he forces a cutback right there. You see him working down the line of scrimmage. Once again, Cole has no control over Daquan here. And so Daquan forces his cutback, and we talk about you know the linebackers making defensive tackles, right? You see Ed Oliver, he's up the field. And so now Bernard has to rectify that situation and make those guys correct. And so Daquan forces the cutback and who's in the gap to make the tackle there. Uh, Bernard is. So we talk about, you know, that, that dance and, and, and being able to make uh, the linebackers making defensive tackles, right? There are times where a three tack or a shade, a shade nose tackle is going to get knocked out of his gap when you're talking run gap integrity. Well, guess what? The defensive, a second level 
Linebackers have to make those guys correct. And you see Bernard come up there and make the tackle in the hole. He's done that so much throughout the entirety of this year, just being able to play off of uh, whatever's happening in front of him. Sometimes it's it's designed gap exchanges and you see it work and you see that dance. And other times it's making these reads on the fly. And again, that, that goes to the run defense being a team effort and also being muddy. It's not the prettiest. Like you may have this gap here, but what if you get knocked out of it and put into another gap or what if they're pulling and running a gap scheme and the numbers change and what happens? And like, you have to be able to adjust on that fly and you highlighted the alley yeah. there. That's a nice hole. That's a nice spot for the running back to cut through, but Jones forces it inside. Bernard makes the play. And then even Spectre shakes off his man to get a hat uh, onto Jalen Warren there and dudes flying to the football. That's there was a little glimmer of hope for Jalen Warren with that alley. And then Bernard yeah. closes it quickly after um, Daquan Jones forced it. This one, this clip really got me to see this alignment and this Great. front down by the goal line. It got me very excited. Yeah. I mean, we have seen these type of odd fronts. So, you know, five uh, guys on the line of scrimmage or defensive line of scrimmage, we've seen it, but we've never seen it with this personnel. And that is with five defensive linemen. So you see Limba Joseph as a nose tackle Ed Oliver as that three tech or four. eye. Vaughn in a two point out wide to the left side of the screen. And then you have Tim Settle as a, a three tech or four eye. And then Shaq Lawson in a two point off to the right side. So five defensive linemen, but an odd front. So it's really five D linemen, one linebacker in Bernard. And then every everyone else is a defensive back. And man, this set is pretty filthy and probably something that mm -hmm. they should run a little more as this season goes on, especially in these situations, whether it's in a low red zone or short yardage situation. But watch Linville Joseph just own. Mason Cole and now Cole does get tripped up a little bit, but control from the start is from Linville Joseph. He just tosses him aside at Oliver working off that double and, and, you know, splitting it really splitting it right there. And they meet at the running back in the backfield. And then everyone just rallies to the ball. This defensive set and structure is very good. When you're talking about some of the depth players that may be playing mm -hmm. behind the defensive line, because it allows them to uh, stay free, stay clean, because this is more of like, hey, you have a center covered up. You have your guards covered up. It's more of like an old school bear look mm -hmm. that really highlights the second level and keeps them clean in, in many ways, depending on how the guys play up front. And the guys up front on this play dominated the interior offensive lineman of the Steelers. 1,000%. And, you know, you mentioned Limbaugh Joseph chucking the center and the center falling. Part of the reason why the center trips over the guard is because Tim Settle jacks up the guard and yeah. gets that full extension, keeps him in place, wrenches him back a little bit. So say Amalu has no movement at all. So when right. Cole gets knocked over to the left, he trips over his man. And then you have all the highlights for the arrows yeah. for everybody. Nice. Add the little arrow cap there for gotcha. Tim Settle. Gotcha. Can't just leave him off. Everybody is eyes in the backfield. Yeah. They are through their gaps. They are attacking the running back. You've got Von Miller. You've got Ed Oliver. You've got Linval Joseph. You've got Tim Settle. Like the physicality and holding strong at the point of attack combined with penetration, like that's how you win in the low red zone. And it was just dominance from the, as soon as the, as soon as from, from snap the whistle on the interior there. And then again, everybody at the second level being able to rally. And this is, this one is so nice because there's multiple parts and pieces that all come together to, to make it work. And for me, it's really highlighted by, you know, Linval knocks his man over, but his man falls over because he trips on the left guard and the left guard is there because Tim settle jacked him up and kept him in place. It's oh, just so many beautiful things that worked. And that's a good thing to have, um, mm -hmm. you know, because you want to be able to continue to limit that run game going forward, whether it's Kansas City or Houston, or if you see Baltimore in the AFC Championship, these teams got run games that can go a little bit. and You want to keep them one-dimensional. Right. So we're going to fast forward a little bit to the third quarter. Uh, Bill, the Bills have, the Steelers have the ball at the Bills' 23-yard line, first and 10 situation. This is a one-yard gain by the Steelers. And uh, again, you know, everyone is kind of pitching in here. You see Daquan Jones pitching in, you see the backside defenders and Ed Oliver, Shaq Loss, and, and even Elam off the edge there. Watch everyone collapse this run right here. It looks like a dual run. And typically this is like the track that the running back is going to take, especially with uh, Washington kind of, you know, washing Shaq Lawson down here. So typically Harris is going to want to bounce, bounce this to Elam, but Elam is so aggressive that he forces Harris to go backside on this. But when Harris goes backside, well, guess who's got leverage and is winning <laughs> over there? Daquan Jones. So he disengages and makes a tackle. Like, great run defense, man. Just everybody doing their job, being aggressive, setting that line of scrim scrimmage, you know, on the defensive line. 
and playing physical, man. They mm-hmm. they were more physical than the Steelers in this game, and a lot of these run fits. And the only time that the Steelers actually got a couple good runs were when the Bills were playing pass and they ran draw plays. But when they were saying, hey, we're going to put two or three tight ends in there and run plays like duo or, or you know power runs, the Bills matched them and matched them physically and just owned the line of scrimmage. Yeah, there were even times where, you know, the Steelers uh, ran crunch, you know, that trap with Wham, but the Bills just would fit off of it and match the physicality and mash. And this this example or this run is a really good example of what I spoke to earlier, where just make things dirty in the run game. Just gum it up. Like, where do you go if you're Najee Harris? There is no clean hole or alley anywhere. Everything is just muddied. Ed Oliver is taking up the left tackle and the left guard. And then Shaq Lawson is jacking up. There you go. You highlighted him there. So he's staying strong at the point of attack there. Shaq Lawson puts Darnell Washington off kilter and he gums up the works there. And then Daquan Jones is working through his man. Like, where do you go? If you're Najee Harris, like you can only go and try and bounce it. And then you try and bounce it and boom, you highlighted more guys. There's guys everywhere. AJ Klein's work making his way off. Um, uh, Vaughn is going through uh, Deontay Johnson off the right. Dorian Williams is in a gap coming through. You've got Kyrie, even like you said, crashing down. Like mm-hmm. the concerted effort and focus, it's oh, who said it? I think Daquan said it the first time we had him on that run defense is a mentality. Mm-hmm. And you could see it in this game that the defense was all hands on deck with we're stopping the run. And I don't know if it had if it was just because it's the playoffs or it's because they were doing their job, or maybe it was a little bit with what Broderick Jones said going into the week that at Oliver talked to post game where they, you know, they felt they could, the Steelers felt they could run the ball a little bit on the bills, whatever it was, the bills came into this game. And like you said, they got, they got, got a couple times and, you know, uh, some, some schemed up situations, but on the whole, when it was like, Hey, we're going to try and mash you. The bills are like, cool, bring it. We're going to own the line of scrimmage. Yeah, here, here's another one of those plays. No gain. I want you to pay attention to Lawson on the line of scrimmage and then also uh, Elam uh, off the edge of number, number 11 right there and watch them collapse that that side of the offensive line. Once again, Shaq Lawson shoots inside and then even Elam, again, physical. Mm-hmm. Like This is what the coaching <laughs> staff has wanted from him. When, when teams want to isolate him uh, in the run game, they want to see that physicality. But more importantly, they want to see the willingness to tackle, and he showed it in this game. It wasn't just in the run game. You know, there were times where, um, you know, when passes were thrown underneath and you saw him attacking the ball, mm. making those tackles. This is another one of those plays. Um, you talked about the trap. They're trying to wham block at Oliver right here, and the Bills just, they, as you say, gum it up on that front side of the play and really just limit where Harris can go. And, and that's the entry point, and they completely wash that out and, and take that play away. Yeah, you get that the crunch play here. You get the trap block from Sayamalu on uh, Daquan Jones, and then you get the wham from Darnell Washington on Ed Oliver. And Ed sees it coming, so he braces himself and he gives that shoulder. Shaq really makes this play for me. He sees, he reads what's happening, and he dives inside of that left tackle and is right in the track, right in the hole. It makes Najee Harris hesitate. And then, yeah, like you said, with Kyrie, like right off rip, him giving a little chuck there to yeah. Allen Robinson and then crashing down and making the tackle that level of physicality. And like you said, the willingness, it's so important in this defense. We we've heard Sean McDermott talk about it all the time. It's one of the reasons Dane Jackson continues to see snaps. The corners need to be able to tackle in this yeah. game and they need to have that willingness to come forward, to stick your nose in the run game. And this is one of those runs where you have to make a play similar to that duo run earlier where, you know, you could be isolated as that corner. You can't be a weakness. You can't be a vulnerability. Kyer wasn't on that play and he worked well in tandem with Shaq Lawson on that front side to really stop it in his tracks. All right. And so on to the last play of this run defense breakdown, there's a two yard gain in the fourth quarter. First and nine situation. I want you to watch Tim settle. We talked about his improvement in the run game and he kind of highlights his, not only just his strength, but his uh, athleticism working down the line of scrimmage. Mm-hmm. And then off the, off the screen on the left-hand side, pay attention to again, Kyer Elam reading the play and getting, you know, sticking his nose in there. So settle, look at the pad level hands, you know, eyes over hey. hands and then watch him just watch his hips. See how his hips kind of tilt this way. Cause he's working with that play side hand. He doesn't want to get reached here by that offensive lineman and just watch him work down the line of scrimmage, watch him work down the line of scrimmage right there. And then right there, you see the cutback in, in Harris uh, by Harris and you see settle. And then once again, Kyrie Elam working in there and, and making the tackle there with Poirier as well. Just good work. Just 
great, you know, coordinated effort and guys just not afraid to stick their nose in there and make plays. And, and everyone, especially at the defensive tackle position, uh, really stood out in the run game, uh, including Tim Settle on this play. Absolutely. Um, um, you, you nailed it for all these pieces. The only thing I want to add is just, I just love the play from Kai year seeing, seeing the route that Poyer and Leonard Floyd take with mm -hmm. trying to string this out and making sure it doesn't get to the sideline. Kyrie doesn't waste any time. He doesn't stay on top of them. He doesn't stay outside. He takes that exact track that you highlighted and he fits off of them right into the alley. That is beautiful run support and gap integrity from your outside corner functioning into the run fit. Like that is exactly what you need. And we've, that, that's akin to what we showed earlier with Terrell Bernard kind of playing off his defensive lineman and making a play. And for Kyrie to do that, again, it speaks to everything um, you spoke to earlier in terms of why he was, you know, somebody you wanted to highlight mm -hmm. as a depth guy who really stepped up. And it, you know, I think a lot of people are going to think of, oh, the interception and all the other near interception, but it really was these run fits where he stepped up and made a lot of plays. And that's not easy to do to, to make a play. We, we show it in slow motion. But that play is happening in like 2.5 seconds. So you yeah. need to make that read in the blink of an eye and you have to be on point and make the right decision in the right moment. And you have to do things right mentally, but then also be in a good position physically with your feet and your base and your shoulder and your head. Like everything happens instantaneously. So that's a great play um, from Mr. Kyir Elam and a lot of coordination for the Bills defense and stopping the Steelers run game. And if we flip to the other side for the Buffalo Bills and the Bills run game, I had some questions about whether or not they were going to be able to run the ball in this game. I know TJ Watt was down, but you know, Cam Hayward is still there, although he's not who, you know, uh, the Cam Hayward of old, they have Keanu Benton, who you and I were talking about before we went live, who is a stud and a monster yeah. inside, but the bills were able to find success um, in the run game. James cook did a really good job setting up his blocks, using his blocks. We saw mm -hmm. them, you know, teams we've talked about here. Teams have been not figuring out, but, working better against the Bills' tackle, wrap, and dart concept. So the Bills went to more mid-zone in this game and some duo, some other aspects of their run game to make it work, and they found success in the run game against the Steelers. Yeah, I thought, you know, watching the game live, like I saw some nice cuts and, and you know, creases found by Cook in the run game. And did he break 100 yards rushing? No, but some of these runs should have been stopped in the backfield. I thought mm -hmm. he showed patience, as you'll see on this first play, but he also pressed the line of scrimmage, but also pressed blocks and timed up those cuts and, and, and jukes with the offensive lineman moving to the next level and really set up a bunch of blocks for uh, guys inside, uh, mm -hmm. especially like you'll see on this play. Um, and he just found those creases just, you know, again, death by a thousand paper cuts. That was kind of how he was running in this game. And just, you know, some they take a loss on one play, but then the next play he's busting off, you know, eight, nine, 12 yards. Um, and like you said, I thought it was interesting how the coverages that the Steelers were playing really, um, really helped the Bills run game. And, and Brady and that staff recognized that. And so they used some of the concepts we're going to break down to accentuate the run game, not necessarily the pass game. So the other thing is, you know, the the ability to run versus eight man boxes. It's not something that uh, Cook has really done a bunch of this mm -hmm. year. Um, I'll bring up these stats real quick because I thought they were very interesting. So this game, uh, uh, thanks to True Media, if you look at um, the defenders in the box stats here, so here in the far column is the, the number of defenders in the box. In this game, James Cook had nine rushes for 50 yards, which is 5.6 yards per rush, uh, the, the longest rush being 11 yards, um, against eight-man boxes. And three, three first downs against those eight-man boxes. Again, we're so used to seeing Cook against six, seven-man mm -hmm. boxes in – maximizing those runs like you're going to see on this first play how the scheme really gave him a light box and he hit it for 12 yards so this was something in this game that was very interesting to see where how and why they were able to do that with james cook yeah and i think that's the that's an area we've we've hammered so much with the bills run game of you're going to get these light boxes and these two high shells because of the pass game and Josh Allen and the threat. So take advantage of it and take advantage of it. But for the bills to be able to come out and be in more kind of known run personnel or situations and the Steelers matching that and them being able to find success, it was a telling piece. And like you said, it also paired in without spoiling anything. Uh, it worked also because of what coverages the Steelers were using and how the bills use those coverage to put the Steelers in disadvantageous run looks. 
Right. And so here's one of those plays that you're just talking about. So it, it looks like a light box and the bills post snap, make it even lighter because they, they show like Kincaid's running the screen. So this is like an RPO where they can really throw it out there or spit it out there. Like Brady, Joe Brady likes to call it. Um, but Josh hands it off, but I want you to watch what that does. This little movement right here by Kincaid, what that does to this guy and what that does to Minka Fitzpatrick right there, it pulls them away from the run fit completely. So now look at how many guys are actually to the run fit. One, two, three, four, five. And that defense is already cut in half. And so that's this is a play where the scheme helped get the Bills a light box, helped James Cook get a light box. But then watch how James Cook maximizes it. Watch how he paces this as he presses the line of scrimmage and how that affects the Steelers, one of the Steelers' better defenders, Highsmith on this play. So look right here. He presses that block and goes north and south towards McGovern. And that really blows up the angle by Highsmith on the back of that play. And it really holds him up. And now he's able to get north and south for 12 yards. It's the tiniest little almost like hitch in the giddy up from James Cook. It almost takes kind of like a little skip step just to have that little boom, that little delay. And then he puts his right foot in the ground and gets north and south. He His success this year on the tackle wrap and dart stuff has been nice to see, but we knew coming out of Georgia, like his familiarity and comfortability with zones, mm -hmm. zone running scheme, similar to his brother, Dalvin cook. I, I hate having to make that comp because they're brothers and they both have dreads and all that stuff, but he is so comfortable running zone and just being like water and flowing wherever he needs to in the run game, that ability to press the line of scrimmage, and set up his blocks and be patient and set up defenders. He did this back at Georgia. So this is old hat for him. And you highlight Alex Highsmith. Like usually we've seen though that backside defender try and honor Josh Allen. Highsmith doesn't on this one. He comes beeline and down, but then runs <laughs> right into Connor McGovern because of Cook's pacing and sets yeah. that up. And like you said, too, the, the little eye candy from Dalton Kincaid, Joe Brady's been really adept at that, at using these little these little pieces that go unnoticed to help pull defenders from the box even further and give the Bills either a plus one in the box or a hat on a hat, which is still advantage offense. Yeah, and so we're going to go to the third quarter. This is a first and 10 situation. It's an 11 yard gain. And once again, Cook using that patience, getting north and south and setting up some of those blocks for this 11 yard gain. But this is kind of when the Steelers or the Bills realize that, hey, the Steelers are playing a lot of uh, man coverage. And specifically, they're playing cover one 35% of the time. And so the Bills said, you know what? If you're going to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to overload the formation. So not only do they bring the extra offensive linemen in, but they have a tight formation with a tight end, Morris and Sherfield out here. So the Steelers have to match that, and they're playing man coverage. So you can see that now with the Bills overlaid, overloading with this trips look over here, the Steelers have to match it with that, you know, so they can leverage the coverage if they need to. And then the Bills, what they did, they just ran their mid zone, and they ran it several times. And watch how Cook presses front side to the weak side of this formation, and as these guys all come down and run fit, he is able to find that cutback lane right here. A good cutoff block by Edwards on the backside. And once again, Cook gets north and south and shows off that quickness and that agility to get to that third level. This happened so many times in this game where they ran a, you know, a condensed set and ran weak side mid zone. And exactly your point, it's because of, you know, and they had numbers advantage on the front side on that weak side because of the Steelers having to match on the other side because they were in man coverage. And this is such an, I don't want to say easy, but an easy read for Cook because of the numbers. Torrance climbs to that second level. So essentially, you've just got a hat on a hat front side. Dawkins has a man. McGovern has a man. Morse has a man. And all James Cook has to do is read that front side block. If Morse were to seal this a little bit and his butt were more to the left, he could cut between Morse and he could right. cut between McGovern. Exactly. Just like that. But Morse's man gets across his face a little bit. So Morse kicks him out. And what does Cook do? He follows that track that you just highlighted, puts his foot in the ground, gets north and south. And then he's got the nice seal on the other side that you initially highlighted with what Edwards is doing and with what Torrance and Spencer Brown are doing. They all provide a nice little alley. Look at that lane. Like that's a beautiful freeze frame. You can't see Cook because he's and behind. That's, a, that's an advantage. Not Absolutely. seeing Cook is an advantage. And that's something that we've talked about. We talked about when the Bills had motor. Like as a mm. linebacker, as a defensive back at the second and third levels, like you can't see the running back until he squirts out the front of this this hole right there, and he's getting again eleven yards on the play. 
Absolutely. Like that's such a great point. You you're trying to diagnose and figure out what's going on. And then you're like, who has the ball? And then here right. comes this short, quick, bursty running back with juice out of nowhere, breaking through the line of scrimmage that you literally cannot see him. Like if you're Mika Fitzpatrick, you're like, where's the ball? Like where's cook? And he's just hidden behind Benton and Mitch Morrison. That's such a, that, that displacement, the hole, the alley, all of those pieces, that's a well executed job by the old line, but it's set up because of the Steelers coverage and what they were in and how the bills dictated to them because of the coverage. Yeah. And so here's the same formation in the fourth quarter. This is a nine yard gain on first down. watch the cutback, but more importantly, keep in mind these mid zone runs are actually meant to get up inside. They're not meant to hit outside. It's not quite outside zone. It's not quite inside zone. It's mid zone. It's kind of in between, right? So the aiming point is generally the tackle here, but it's a play that generally wants to get a little displacement horizontally, but then get up inside. And so watch what you know, Cook sees here on the backside. Watch Brown, watch David Edwards, that displacement they create initially, and then you see that boom right there. I mean, the mm. fact that Cook found this little crease is just fabulous. That that patience and ability to press the line of scrimmage but feel where that entry point into the line of scrimmage was going to be on the backside was just beautiful. And we, we saw it several times in this game. And we actually saw it when they played the Steelers. Was it in the preseason or was that last year when they played them? Preseason. They ran mid zone a ton. Preseason. Was it preseason? Oh, no. no, it was last year, wasn't yeah, it? Last year. Yeah, yeah, I'm confusing yeah, the year. uniforms. Yeah, last year. No, he scored a yeah, 20 or 25 yard touchdown against the Steelers on mid zone last year. Yeah, the one that like capped it towards the end after yep. the multiple Gabe Davis touchdowns. Yeah, it just, I, I love this for him. You said it. He, this was kind of his strength, the zone runs uh, coming out of Georgia. Uh, and his ability in this game to find those creases and find where, you know, that displacement was going to happen, where those little bubbles were mm -hmm. to hit. I mean, he found them several times off of this concept. And this is beautiful of having these plays back to back in the film for everyone. So the previous play, you saw how the coverage dictated the front. And what we talked about was on that front side of the run to that weak side where they mm -hmm. were going, you had a hat on a hat. It was three versus three. Dawkins had a man. McGovern had a man. Morse had a man. Now, because of the front, it's a little bit different on that front side. Now you've got the three D line defenders. You've also got Miles Jack coming yeah. from that second level on that left side. So now you've got four to that front side. But the beauty of zone runs is they play out based on the rules that you have for the blocking scheme. And then it's the running back's job to find wherever the hole develops. And exactly like you said, Cook starts on that mid zone track. And then he follows those blocks and just finds the hole. And you highlighted Spencer Brown yeah. and David Edwards. And that hole develops on the backside of the run because there's more bodies on the front side, but the bills are still able to create an alley and just, yeah, the fluidity and the smoothness of cook to get North and South. Oh, and then you get a little bit of that, uh, that solemn skier aspect yeah. to the style on this play where yeah. he cuts it back and puts the right foot and jumps through that hole. Um, also his ability to just make sure like he's picking up his feet and he's not tripping over David Edwards as he gets into the hole, he clears Spencer Brown, who's helping to make contact there as well. It's just, it's a good job of the bills taking advantage of their athleticism up front, James Cook's athleticism and his comfortability. And like, again, familiarity with this type of scheme. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful synchronization with the play we showed before because it's the exact same run from almost the exact same offensive alignment but based on how the defense played it it plays out differently for the bills but both of them generate success All right and so this is the last run of the breakdown we're going to throw a ty johnson run in there uh, on essentially the same concept the second and 10 situation it's 11 yard gain we're in the fourth quarter under four minutes here uh and, and the bills went heavy here not only do they have edwards in there but they have a, a couple tight ends there and you see johnson press Weak side run here, but he makes the cutback. But I want you to, once again, pay attention to the displacement by Brown, but pay attention to the technique, the hand technique mm. of Edwards on this play versus mm -hmm. Cam Hayward. And watch how he chops down that hand and, and throws Hayward off. Johnson cuts it back. Knox gets a piece of the defender in the gap, and you get Johnson north and south on the backside of this mid zone run. And then watch. Watch the Edwards at guns. the end of this play. Look at him. I wonder who he's doing that. Look at watch, watch Edwards right here. Look at this. <laughs> back, back. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I wonder who he's shooting that to. <laughs> yeah, I want I wonder who on the sideline would be a huge fan of that at this moment. <laughs> um, you know, Ed Edwards had uh 
another rep like this earlier in the game where he just uses that hand technique and he just chops down and, and uses it to reach his man and seal like the, the performance of the offensive line this year in the run in the past, it's been so integral to what this bills team has been. They have consistently been one of the best rushing teams from a non Josh Allen perspective all year, top five or top seven at worst in EPA per attempt. They've been moving it in a variety of ways. They've got multiple schemes and systems that they can lean on depending on what the team is that they're facing. And we've seen them be very successful with duo with this mid zone run with tackle wrap and dart and to be able to get that success. You even see a little bit on the back end too. You highlight yeah, in there man. Dalton Kincaid, even using that hand technique a little yeah. bit against Marcus. Golden. Like, yep. To just you, <laughs> when we made this, we've alluded to this a ton of times. This is what you saw from like Cooper cup and Tyler Higby and Robert mm-hmm. Woods and all these non-offensive linemen in LA when Aaron Cromer was there. And now, like once, you know, Cromer being in like another full year with this Bills team, we're really starting to see the Cromerisms and the Cromer core pieces reflect in this offensive line, but even more so the tight ends and the receivers blocking it's man. And it's been super important considering how much the Bills want to run 12 or when they put Gabe Davis or Trent Sherfield in there and these receivers are fitting in on like on runs, like they're inserting as actual blockers against linebacker or edges. Like it's been needed from them. And, um, this year, you know, we, we gushed about Cromer last year when he was brought in. And I don't think the return on investment was necessarily seen right away for people in year one, but year two, you're just seeing the Cromer aspect reflected in almost like every single drive. Right. And someone, Charles brought it up. So I have to bring it in. I have to show it. Uh, so this is a, a, a play I posted on Twitter right before we went live and he's talking about the uh, ass block. And this is something, a technique <laughs> that Howard Mudd, used to teach. And, and so I want you to watch this ass block and really this slingshot technique by Dalton Kincaid on the backside right here uh, over Highsmith on, on the backside of this play. I'll let it run. But watch initially the slingshot move, which is, okay, there's no way for Dalton Kincaid on the backside, backside of this play to reach block and seal off Highsmith. So they teach a technique. And the guy that taught me this technique and how it's executed was Richie Incognito back in the day when he was with the Bills, mm. when Cromer was his coach. So he's not going to get across the face of him. So what he does is they call the back door. They call the slingshot technique. You'll see him right there. Grab that hip and kind of throw him upfield by him so that he can get ahead of him. And then there's the ass block. It's really just like a box out. This is a Howard Mudd technique, one that he always used to teach and just doing whatever it takes to get it done. So you see these techniques, uh, like you said, filtering down, not just to the offensive linemen, but to the skill players, to the tight ends, to the wide receivers. We're seeing it everywhere. In, in year two with Cromer, the run game has been strong, but the technique, mm-hmm. it's because of the technique that they're teaching, um, you know, Cromer's teaching and, and, and Gunn as well, his assistant. Just awesome work, um, you know, of, of these technique techniques being done. There's that ass block and that slingshot technique. And you see Highsmith is pissed. Yeah, he's like, he thinks he hold, is yeah. mad. He's yeah. big mad on this play. It seemed like. Uh, several Steelers were big mad in this uh, after this game, I'm sure. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I mean, from Heisman's <laughs> perspective, you feel like you're a wide receiver and the DB just grabbed your hips and kind mm-hmm. of pass interfered with you. And you're like, what the hell? He just stopped me. But that's man. And to see to see this, you know, you, you could play devil's advocate and be like, well, of course, David Edwards is going to use like technique like that. He's been with Cromer for forever. He's a vet. And, you know, if you wanted to kind of lean into those pieces, but seeing it get down to Dalton Kincaid is awesome. One for Aaron Cromer, but two for Dalton Kincaid, because I don't know how many people we had to fight off after the draft being like, well, he can't block and he sucks at blocking. And it's like, no, like, is his technique perfect? Absolutely not. But he, the biggest thing we said when it came to Dalton Kincaid's blocking was that He is a willing blocker and he's very good against nickels and safeties and he can even crack on linebackers, but we'd see what he would do in the NFL against NFL linebackers and NFL size and edge players. But the willingness has always been there. Now you're starting to see the increase in the technique. That slingshot move gets used by the best of the best in the NFL. And it, and if you do it wrong, it can be a flag or it can get messy. He did that to perfection there. And that's a credit to him and to Aaron Cromer, of course. Yeah, and it's quick, and it's usually on the backside of the play. It's rarely ever called, especially like if it's not pointed out by the coaching staff, the opposing coaching staff mm-hmm. prior to the game. Uh, they're not gonna, they're not expecting that from Dalton Kincaid on the backside oh. of their run. So, um, I I was asked on Twitter, and someone mentioned, you know, in the chat, is that a hold? I'm like, 
technically, yeah, it can be called, but it's rarely called on the backside of that play. And again, if it's done that quickly and that cleanly, they're not, they're rarely going to call it. So, and it's um, against so a dude who can ball. Like Alex mm -hmm. Highsmith is a dude. Like, and I know people, well, he gets to eat off of TJ Watt. He had multiple reps in this game where he ate up Deion Dawkins. Mm -hmm. He's a good dude off the yes. edge. And so he has a kind of a little bit of a right, like you said, to be pissed off on that play. Yeah, and Sophia adds, sack that that thumbs up button for a beat down of the Chiefs. Let's go, guys. We appreciate everyone being here right now. Uh, we broke down the run defense of the Bills. We just went through some of the run plays by the Bills offense and how the running backs kind of set up some of the blocks by the offensive line and how and why the you know the Bills attacked with some of these schemes. So uh, as Sophia said, hit that like button. Leave us a comment of your favorite plays from this. Um, and we're going to move on to the passing game, but Sophia, we appreciate that that super chat and uh, everyone joining us tonight in the film room. Absolutely. Yeah, very much. Uh, thank you, Sophia. And we had uh, a super chat that I pulled up earlier. There was no comment. It was just from Nathan who just gave us five bucks. So we appreciate you, Nathan. Thank and you. yeah, whether it's the super chat piece or the engagement and everybody being here, we, uh, it, it's an awesome piece to be able to sit here and have the engagement from you folks joining us over 200 people live here on a Wednesday night, uh, reviewing some wild card tape with us. And so again, the super chats, the engagement, word of mouth, likes, all that stuff. It's tremendously important to us as is our subscribers or our subscribers to our uh, cover one, one pass, those insiders. Um, it's a premium piece that we offer here as part of the brand. And to give you a little more insight into that piece, we have Mr. Greg Thompson and Aaron Quinn with a short little video. Many people ask us the best way to support us here at Cover One, and that is to sign up to become a Cover One One Pass member. That contribution helps give us the access to all the data and information we use to create the content that you love. And I think most importantly, brings you into our community of insiders. It's a great community based on Slack. I know a lot of people don't want to be on social media anymore, or be in on those conversations. We bring all of it to you right in our great community of educated fans. And most importantly, you get access to our content creators. Even better than that, everybody loves merch. You get awesome t-shirts, a cool decal, and a letter from the Cover One team signed directly to you. All for $60. That gets you the entire season, next year's free agency and draft. 60 bucks. Click the link in the description. Cover One Insider. Become one today. Yeah, we always say, you know, we couldn't do any of this stuff without you guys, without our insiders, without your support, whether it's just hitting that like button, you know, making a comment, it helps us on YouTube. It helps us uh, track and trend um, the Telestrator, all these stats and memberships, like all of that is brought to you uh, from our network, but brought to you by the insiders and, and, and guys like everyone that's in here right now, just watching and doing what they can to, you know, share our content with uh, everyone else that appreciate this type of in-depth content. Yeah. And the, we talk about it every week. The Slack channel is, is such a huge piece of that insider part. And especially in a week like this, we've talked a ton in this episode about the injuries to the Bills defense. That cover one Slack channel for our insiders has been a pretty good source of information when it comes mm -hmm. to injury statuses on Terrell Bernard and Christian Benford and Bale Inspector. Again, we, we talk about it all the time. We are we're not a news breaking type of brand or organization, but for those insiders, for the initiated that we bring in, um, that Slack channel is a good source of information. So if you are on that Slack channel, you're sitting here right now, kind of knowing what's up with Christian Benford and what's up with Terrell Bernard and what's up with their timelines and what's going to look like for this weekend and going forward. And, um, even just aside from that, it's, again, we talk about it every single week. It's a really great community of passionate fans, but without the toxicity of, Twitter or X or whatever you're calling it or general social media. It's just one <laughs> awesome piece. And it's an awesome place for us to connect further with you guys, Eric. You, you know, you talk about it every week or the, when we talk about this, like the off season stuff and the meetups that we have mm -hmm. with the people from the Slack channel and the people who come through and are like, Oh, Anthony or Eric, like it's so-and-so from the Slack channel and you immediately can know right. their icon and their handle. And you just kind of, it's, it, it's just an awesome experience and an awesome community. Yeah, our insiders, they're, they're the core and foundation of, you know, a lot of the content ideas that we even uh, bring mm -hmm. to the table. So um, if you do have the opportunity, get to the website, cover1.football, and sign up to become an insider. So with that said, let's pivot to some of the, the Josh Allen content. Why all of you guys are here every single week, <laughs> J.A., and I said he played, you know, one of his, his better games, and it, he was that triple threat. He had the, the passing. He had the running with his legs. He had, you know, the stuff from the shoulders up. He had that elite quarterback look in his eye in this game. And he, he saw the field well. He distributed the ball all over the field. 
I mean, 46% of his 46.7% of his targets went to receivers, 26.7% went to tight ends, 26.7% went to running backs. So everyone had, you know, targets in this game. They spread it around. And I thought he played so calm and collected. He rarely was sped up by the Steelers, even when they blitz. Mm-hmm. And they blitzed a bunch in this game, Anthony, right? What, 52.9% of the time? Yep. And he did not speed up his game. He did not speed up his processing. He had good answers. He got rid of it. When nothing was there, he took the sack. He didn't turn it over. Um, I thought he took the profit so well in this game. And overall, he just had the right answers and really the right mindset in this game and and just took the opportunities when they're there. But when they weren't, he just ate them and moved on to the next play. Absolutely. Um, before I add on to that, I want to bring up this comment in Super Chat from Carl, which I think is awesome. Carl, you're here pretty much every single week. Yeah. Actually, not even pretty much. You are here every single week. You're very generous with your Super Chats. We appreciate the absolute hell out of you. So thank you for being here again. Thank you for the Super Chat. And I love this comment. Um, Carl says, there are certain nights that are for favorite shows. When I was young, Friday nights were for nice. X-Files. Wednesday nights are the, for the cover one film room. This especially hits home for me. My older brother was a big X Files dude. So yeah. as soon as you mentioned this, I just remember how passionate he that was. was a staple. Like, yeah. Bro, yeah. Like every yeah. X Files, X Files, X Files. And I feel you on like certain nights being for certain shows. So I think this is a pretty awesome comment to know yeah, that thanks, we, we rank it. up there for you. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Man, that was a cool one. That got me sidetracked. Josh Allen. Yeah, good stuff from Josh Allen. Um, I I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. His he was playing on time a lot mm-hmm. in this game. His reads, his footwork, getting the ball out, like pulling the trigger. We didn't see that hesitation where, well, oh, this guy's open. Should I or should I do? No, it was on time and in rhythm. And he didn't turn the ball over. And this was a huge point in this game. You just did not want to play into the Steelers hands. You were the better football team schematically and on paper. Just don't do anything that gives the Steelers any pendulum swinging momentum swinging plays. Just keep them at bay. And he did that. He also had some spectacular high variance plays in this one that obviously put points on the board, but he didn't do anything to kill himself or the offense in this game. He was on time. He was on pace. He was on rhythm. He kept the bills ahead of the sticks in a lot of ways. He, he played football very well from the head up in a lot of this game and any mistakes that he had in this game were just general, you know, nobody's perfect. You can't always make the perfect throw. Granted, he did have a couple of nasty, perfect throws in this game, but his ability to just, yeah, work against the blitz and just be comfortable in a lot of forms and fashions. Um, very impressive game for him and very nice to see considering we're in the playoffs and we need him to be at that level consistently. Yeah. So let's get into some of this film. Let's take a look at a few of the plays from, Allen and the offense specifically through the air. Um, so we talked about how often the Steelers blitz and I thought Allen had some really good answers. Thanks to Joe Brady in this game. And again, he played smart uh, against the blitz. He was 11 for 16 for 119 yards and two touchdowns. So you're going to see a bunch of those plays uh, here in the film room. And, and this was early in the game, a 10 54 on the clock in the first quarter It's a 20 yard gain on a play. We've broken down several times. But it's a different wrinkle. And this is what I love about Joe Brady and how he sequences plays and creates layers on top of plays that we have seen. So we've seen this you know, jet action across the formation, usually digs there. This time it's Isabella. And instead of you know running that sail concept or running the curl here or that sail concept we saw against the Dolphins, this time they run it all the way across the field on a deep over. And so Josh uh, finds Kincaid down the field. But thanks to some really nice blocking on this play too, Anthony, if we look at it from the end zone angle and let me bring up this other angle right here. Um, watch. I want you to watch Spencer Brown right here. Initially he slides down inside and then picks up 99, but then he realizes because David Edwards is staying in the block and the running backs coming across the formation, they fire these guys and add on as blitzers. Watch Brown pull off here of 99 and realize 93 is coming and just picks him up. And that allows Josh to stay in the pocket and allows him to be patient. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it allows him to set his feet and to get his mechanics correct, which is something he talked about going into that Dolphins game in week 18 about resetting the fundamentals and getting back to those fundamentals when it comes to mechanics. And he's able to set his mechanics properly here. It does that little hop that we talked about years ago, and it allows him to what? Place that ball perfectly to Kincaid down the field. 
Yeah, he's the, it starts with the protection that uh, the dish, as you always call it, right. there for for him to sit and have that good platform, and you can see just how look how comfortable Allen is, like and in rhythm, he hits his step. I also love that little bit right there. Yes, you knew exactly where I was going for him to hold Minka Fitzpatrick as that post safety. You talked about it with the coverage numbers for how much cover one they played. They also played a bunch of cover three. Like there was a ton of post safety action in this game, and him holding Minka Fitzpatrick with his eyes to make sure Patrick Fitzpatrick doesn't get over the top, which is possible because Minka Fitzpatrick is awesome. And especially from a range yeah. perspective and yeah, you just get an absolute dot from Josh Allen. I also love two things here on the catch. I like the late hands from Dalton Kincaid to not give the DB any opportunity to think the ball is coming. Like he throws those hands up in the last moment. And then right there, that, that That's freeze crazy. frame is perfect. Roe rips through the right arm of right Kincaid arm. and pulls it away. And Kincaid just keeps it with his left and tucks it away with his left. This is good coverage <laughs> that gets beat by a good throw. And this actually is a pretty good play on the ball to try and rip through and force a PBU. But Kincaid just... <laughs> Man, that's pretty, just man. wild. Like, yeah, to have your, he makes he makes a two hand catch, gets one of his hands ripped away, and then is like, okay, let me just contort my hand and cradle it with my off hand and bring it in. Like, that's a really silky play at the catch point from Dalton Kincaid. Yeah, great call early in the game. This is a play the Bills have shown on film. They just build a layer on it. So good work by the staff and Brady. And then just great execution, as you said, eye discipline, eye manipulation of that post safety, holding him on the logo, and then finding the matchup and getting your mechanics correct against the blitz to throw this on point to mm. Kincaid down the field. And then Kincaid just makes him look, uh, makes Josh look correct for making that throw down the field. Awesome stuff early in the game, man. Like it's when it's set up like that versus the blitz. And uh, this is a couple clips. Uh, that we saw. This is from the Dolphins game. You mm -hmm. see it run the same thing, but it's the sale concept. So they keep it to the top of the screen and to that upper third uh, there down the field off the play action. And then once again, the Jets game, the first game uh, that Brady took over, mm -hmm. fake the digs. And then now they're just sitting over the middle to Kincaid. Mm -hmm. So I love those layers. I love those layers. And that's what you have to do. You have to fool a defense and they're going to have to do it against the Chiefs this week because the Chiefs defense is Damn good. Yeah, and, they're a really good defense. And that's the stuff, Eric. We, we talk about it all the time. Like, once you, once you get to the playoffs, who you are, everything is on tape. And mm -hmm. it's kind of it, – it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because Brady's been the OC since week 11. So you still, if you're a defense, you don't really know everything that Joe Brady is. But also, you have less tape to go through in order to try and figure out everything that he is. So him adding these layers onto that concept – that's how you win playoff football because you yeah. run that play and that's where defense goes, oh, I know exactly what's coming. It's that sale concept or you know what? Even if it's not, Dalton Kincaid's going to sit. I got this. And he's like, nope, I'm running it over and it's going back the other way. Like those are those little pieces where you set a defense up thinking that A is coming and out of nowhere you throw him B. And let's be honest, we haven't seen that. We never saw that type of sequencing or play layering from Dorsey. We just hadn't. We hadn't seen that. From no, the, close, the closest was – um like the gadget stuff to Deontay Hardy and then using that to build a pass off of right. it and go from there. But it's different than the type of structured alignment sequence right. that we're seeing now. Yeah. All right. So let's go uh, further into the first quarter, Seven zero five on the clock, uh, second and seven situation. This is the touchdown, the Dawson Knox. And mm -hmm. uh, again, kind of using the personnel here to set up uh, the touchdown, the Knox. So you have cook and, and Dawson Knox at the top of the screen. That's a nub tight end set three by one set, three receivers at the bottom of the screen. Nub tight end attached to the line of scrimmage. And this is just Josh, once again, uh, elite quarterbacking, again, from the shoulders up. So initially, he looks out to Cook, and Cook is just running this little diagonal route to the flats. And you see Josh look to him and even kind of pump fake to him. Mm -hmm. And that catches the attention of the linebacker and this defensive back as Knox runs this corner. But it also catches the attention of Highsmith, who is rushing off the edge here. And he's unblocked, Anthony. Unblocked right here. And that kind of slows Highsmith up long enough for Josh to reset and to hit Knox in that window created from that little pump fake and that hesitation from the DB for the touchdown down the field. Just great work from Josh buying himself time with a little pump fake. And when Josh does that little pump fake or those shoulder yeah. fakes, Money. you know he's owning. You know yeah. he's vibing out, and he was in this game. Usually when he goes with that pump fake, it's either a great decision and or a dot that comes after it. And – I, I love just from the start, like the offensive line is sliding to the right. So Allen knows like high Smith is his man and he's responsible for him. And that, that look to cook, 
it's so subtle, it's so brief, and it gets Peterson at the corner, it gets Roberts from the second level, and it causes that hesitation in Highsmith, and it also kind of changes Highsmith's track slightly and yep. makes him kind of step outside a little bit more, which allows Allen to have a little bit more of an open window on the inside, inside. where exactly where his arm angle is to get that ball to Knox. It's such a subtle little movement. It's not an over-exaggerated pump fake. And even us showing it now, like in slow motion, you see it, but when you play it in like regular time, it's subtle. It's not even, it's almost just like he opens up the shoulder a little bit and it's that shoulder action and it gets all three guys to commit. And then there's so much space for Knox. It's just a basic high, low concept, almost functions like a smash concept, but Allen really adds on to it um, with that little shoulder shimmy slash pump. And it gets, you know, three dudes to commit and open up in different ways and create space. Yeah, that little, again, that shoulder fake is usually uh, an indicator that he's playing really well. He's, he's going to be on point. Yeah. yeah. But also, it, it kind of you can kind of see here how he resets his feet. So he's open right there, and he's horizontal. He's almost right to the looking at the sideline there, which is why those DBs and, and guys kind of uh, react that way. But watch him quickly reset right there. Now he gets his, he, uh, we call it the hallway. We talked about it last week. The arch mm. of that foot should be going to the target. And so he's able to still reset. And I think that's what that little pump fake, you know, bought him. Because if he didn't do that, Highsmith's coming 100 miles an hour at mm -hmm. him. So it allowed him to buy time to reset his mechanics and his footwork so that he can make this throw. And then you see the rotation. You see that core rotate. You see those hips rotate through. You get that little hop that he, you know, brought from Jordan Palmer those years mm -hmm. of Jordan Palmer and training with him. And he's able to throw that dime down the field for the touchdown. And when I saw this play, Anthony, it reminded me of a play where uh, he hit Tyler Croft against these Steelers uh, in 2019 in the red zone on the same type of concept to the corner. Oh, um, in Pit in Pittsburgh. Yes, it was in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yep. Yep. In the, in the corner of the end zone, same exact concept in the low red zone um, against obviously the Steelers. So uh, that's what kind of it reminded me of. And I'm like, man, that's, it's so fitting because people don't realize that when you play these teams, whether it's a division opponent or another AFC opponent is mm. usually when you start your game plan for this, this season against that team, Usually, usually you start by going back and seeing what worked and seeing if you can still run those things in specific situations because that corner and that linebacker screwed up the assignment of the tight end and running back. They did not match it properly against uh, the Bills back in 2019, and that's what happened um, for the touchdown to, to Croft. Same thing happened here. You saw Patrick Peterson looking back at the linebacker like there Dude. was some type of miscommunication. Yeah, absolutely, and, and especially when you have a consistent – coaching staff there you know those coaching elements or those mm -hmm. rules or those adjustments are still going to be rarely in changes exactly yeah, rarely so changes. You, you just attack them so you could go back like four or five years and if that staff is still in place exactly to your point yeah those fundamentals are there you attack them you exploit them. all right and so we move forward to the easy loan auto sales making it look easy play the game this is the 29 yard touchdown to dalton kincaid on the bender route down the middle of the field on a dot but there's so much to love about this play. I know on the field, but we need to start with the situation because we always talk about the different play calls on a play call sheet for a coach, Anthony, you know, base plays, first and 10 plays, uh, third and short plays. Like every situation is outlined on a play call sheet. And this play is one of those situations. Usually you have like two or three calls that you want to run on a sudden change or sudden turn situation like this situation. When the bills took away the ball, from the Steelers offense, immediately you saw Joe Brady come out and call this play to Kincaid down the field. And it's just great work from Josh Allen on this play. So he's got digs right here in the seam. So Josh opens there. Again, he was he was in, in his bag. You know, mm -hmm. Brady was in his bag, but also Josh was vibing right here. He opens two digs and that holds his safety. Now you have the bender route right here by Kincaid, but then you also have Shakir working inside and then going to the corner on a divider route. And that is going to hold Fitzpatrick right here. So you have a middle of the field open concept with the two safeties, split safeties. You have middle of the field open and you have a bender route going right into that open area. Very good play call in this situation. And then the execution was just beautiful. Josh hits it in rhythm, throws it right down the middle, right onto the hands of Kincaid and Anthony. This catch bro, is so underrated and it's not being talked about enough. So Watch this throw. It's a rope, first of all. It's a rope, but then the hands away from the frame Fingertips. on the basket catch, Bro. the hand-eye coordination on this and, you know, the firmness in the hands, like right there, man, it's a pretty play 
top down from the play call, the, the game plan mm -hmm. from Brady to the execution with the eye manipulation and holding that safety and having the route by Shakir hold Fitzpatrick opening up for your first round tight end for the 29 yard touchdown. That's why it's our easy loan auto sales, making it look easy play of the game. And Kincaid also doesn't even break stride when he makes that catch. Like he goes up and gets it. And when he hits the ground, he just resumes the gate that he had as he was running this route. Like it's such a beautiful throw, everything you said, the execution and, um, you know, this is, this, this is the exact look you want for this play call. I also believe, um, I think in your breakdown from Monday, not Monday, Tuesday, this week is screwed up because it's a stupid Monday game. <laughs> yeah, it was the breakdown you did for Tuesday, I think you clipped, you, you snippeted the press conference piece that Alan talked yeah. about. Like they practice this play against the situation. This is what they were looking for. Like they get that cover too. They get the split safety look. What's also nice too is, even if somehow they rotated to cover three, there's still answers for this play built in with where Kincaid's going, where Shakir is going, yeah. Dawson Knox coming in underneath. Like mm -hmm. this works against multiple concepts, but although this is what they are looking for um, right here. And yeah, their man up top coming on the uh, in breaker is even more wide open, Ty Johnson up top. But just like you said, perfect play call for the situation. They anticipated this. This is right after the turnover, so you're trying to take that shot play and take advantage. You yeah, maximize that momentum, that, right? Yep. Swing that pendulum even further in your favor. And also, like we talked about, play to that game script, right? You want to put the Steelers even more on that back foot and get them out of their comfortable pattern that they like to live in. And one other little play, it starts out bad for Mitch Morse here. We talked about Keanu Benton earlier. Benton wins inside yeah. on Morse, but watch Morse do just enough to recover and widen exactly yeah. and push Benton out a little bit. And that functions in with Josh Allen, the little track you just highlighted for him, just a simple little shift over stays comfortable with his hop step has so good pretty. bro. It's so just, pretty. he's, he was in line in this game with his mechanics and that's what we we've, we've talked about it more. I think under the radar that we have in episodes, but his mechanics have been sloppy this year. And we yeah. I know we've talked about it on the show, but whether it's footwork or uh shoulder placement and just angles to the ball and everything, like sometimes he pulls these rabbits out of his hats, but a lot of poor mm -hmm. throws this year have been due to poor mechanics. His mechanics were on point in this game, especially early on. And just, there's so much to like here. The schematics, the Kincaid piece, the play call, the Allen piece, the Morse adjustment, all of it. And, it wasn't easy, but the Bills made it look easy, <laughs> and that's why it is our making it look easy, easy loan auto sales play of the game, sponsored, of course, by Easy Loan Auto Sales, who regardless of your credit situation, Easy Loan can help get you behind the wheel and on the road to better credit. All of their vehicles include a two-year, 24,000-mile warranty, and they have three convenient locations in Buffalo, Lockport, and Niagara Falls. They can get you driving today. Go to EasyLoanAuto.com to start your accelerated approval, and all of their information can be found in our episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform you're listening to the show on. Yeah, awesome, awesome plays, man. Like, that. <laughs> that's why you draft Kincaid. And, Bro. you know, with Gabe Davis being out, they need a vertical threat. And if it can come from Kincaid in the passing game this week against the Chiefs, uh, getting Kincaid vertically down the field, getting Knox vertically down the field, that will help replace some of that vertical threat loss that they're going to have with Davis not playing this weekend. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's cool. nice to see them start. It's something we've wanted to see yes. uh, from you know Kincaid, <laughs> especially given some of his film. Um, and I think we're starting to see that now. And so that's a whole nother ball game on how do you stop that or how do you deter getting a tight end down the field again you see him he's so smooth we say it every week he's so smooth and as you said that stride he didn't break stride and you know you saw the hands catch that's not an easy catch guys i can't like it's one thing if the ball's dropping in tip down and he's catching it like a basket catch but he was doing that away from his frame, up over his yes, head, up on over an his angle, shoulders, on that on trajectory. Angle. He's he's going up and bringing it in. It's not coming to him. He's going up and cradling it and bringing it in. That's that's mad hard. Like that's not with a velocity thrill from Josh Allen. Yes, like, it's on crazy. A 
no, yeah. that's it. Yeah, he's just so fluid and smooth with everything. And I love the piece that you mentioned too about Kansas City. Um, I talked about it last night on disguise coverage. Won't get into the numbers too much, but Steve Spagnolo makes it a point to take away Stefan Diggs. Mm-hmm. And I would anticipate that happening again this weekend, which means someone else has to step up. And I think from a matchup perspective, it could be Kincaid. It could also be Knox. Um, some running backs out of the backfield Cook. where the Chiefs mm-hmm. yep, just struggle a little bit from a DVOA perspective. Um when they cover against tight ends and against RBs, I'm a little better than uh, against tight ends and RBs, but yeah, it's going to have to be somebody other than Diggs this weekend. And with the rhythm that Kincaid is on and even Shakir a little bit, I look to those dudes to have a big weekend. All right. So moving forward, third and seven situation here. We talked about how often the Steelers played man coverage. And this is one of those plays, single high look, cover one look. And you know what? We're going to bring back this little segment, Josh's jukes. Mm-hmm. I should name it Josh's fake slide. I was going to say, should this be Josh's slides? (laughs) So man coverage and Josh knew it, but the Steelers brought the blitz on this play. And the problem we talked about with the cover zero pressures, right? The cover zero blitzes last week. Risk reward. It's it's very risky. The the Steelers bring uh, the house here and Josh finds that crease and he's able to take it to the house for 52 yards. Touchdown dropping guys like flies on on, en route to the end zone and where he's able to celebrate with Bill's Mafia. Uh, understanding that, hey, he needs to make a play here in the second quarter, and they got man coverage. There was really no one open, and he just made a play with his legs. Again, that triple threat, Josh Allen, that we need to see going forward in the playoffs. We talked about it with the cover zero stuff last week, like you said, and we've talked about when when teams blitz Allen, especially with these cover zero looks, like he's not looking for like five-yard completions. Like He tries to go for the throw with the throws that he attempts. And we talked about why it was very risky, but it's the same from a Josh Allen legs perspective, because if you don't maintain rush lane integrity, he's going to break contain and then he's in the open field. And it's so funny to see everybody talking about whether it was a slide or not. I just think it's such an uncoordinated juke and like his brain. is with him. Yeah, that's what he is. Like he's not, he's not some, he's an, he's very athletic, but when it comes to his jukes, it's not like he's not Barry Sanders in the open field. It's very herky jerky, like 245 pounds. Like, yeah, Yeah. it's not, it's not pretty. I mean, did you guys see him run his 40? He was like Dwight Schrute running the, yeah, you know, like great calls. Yeah, it was like Dwight Schrute running on Schrute Farms trying to get some beats. Yeah, it was not great. Yeah, he runs, or even he runs like Moe's, like Dwight's cousin who lives on the (laughs) farm. It's just very uncoordinated. You highlighted, um, Hardy, as we were making all these office yeah. jokes, Hardy, Isabella, Dalton Kincaid coming out of the left side right. of the screen. This run, obviously, it's a tremendous play by Josh Allen, right? But this play doesn't happen if not for the downfield blocking of Isabella, Kincaid, and Hardy. And that one on Kincaid, I know Minka Fitzpatrick is kicking himself because he slows up thinking mm-hmm. that Allen is going to get stopped. And then he tries to kick it back into high gear. Exactly right there. He's just like, okay, like, this play is going to be over. You see Minka in the middle of the field, but Kincaid yeah. is still working. And when Allen breaks that tackle, Kincaid has given up, or Fitzpatrick has given ground because he slowed up, and Kincaid turns on the Jets, even gets a piece of Peterson downfield. Like, these type of downfield runs, even for running backs, quarterbacks, whoever, they don't happen if your receivers aren't making an effort. Like, look at Hardy. Hardy's making a legit block. Mm-hmm. Hands on his man, looking to see where Allen is, driving his man outside. And then, of course, you got the GOAT, Andy Isabella, on the field, who good things always happen when GOAT Abella's on the field. Just, man, that play was a huge, another pendulum-swinging play from Josh Allen. And when, you, when you have these plays mixed in, with him playing quarterback from the neck up and playing on time and in rhythm, he's unstoppable because there's no one like him in the NFL. Yeah, and here's another play versus the Blitz. First and 10 situation in the second quarter, 4-0-4 on the clock. This is the 34-yard gain from Allen to Hardy at the top of the screen. The Steelers, once again, they they send the they send the pressure, and the Bills keep in Dawson Knox and James Cook to help you know pick up that Blitz, and they do a good job of everyone picking up and allowing Josh to stand in the pocket. You see Josh slide up into the hallway, into the pocket, and find Hardy late. And we talked about it last week, some of those unsung heroes, one of them being Hardy. You know, mm-hmm. if they can get some of these, these plays versus man coverage versus the blitz where Hardy's one-on-one, he's able to get the ball in his hands, that's when you've got, you, you can start to see some of you know that speed take place and some of that run after catch or yards after the catch ability really show up. Yeah, I I would really love for them to get Deontay Hardy involved more. And 
I know you you've talked about it at different points and and I, I've noticed it on film as well. Like his his route running just isn't always there for him to separate and be there. And I know um and we even got one in the in the comments there, like this is what I we've been waiting five months to see from Hardy. And a lot of it isn't it's not Dorsey, it's not Brady, like it's a lot of it is Hardy. Like he just doesn't put him in the best, put himself in the best. I mean, you can see him stumble there. right there. Yeah, like, I, I know was the gonna surface say he, was kind of crappy, but still, like even just something like that. Yeah, and he's he's got a route later um, against Patrick Peterson where he runs this route almost the exact same way, and Peterson's all over it, and there is no mm -hmm. separation. So some of it is on Hardy, but to your point, when you can get him the ball in the open field, he's so electric. I didn't know if there was a safety over the top, so when he makes this first move on the broadcast, I thought he was gone. When he yeah. makes that cut right there, I was like, oh, house, when he cuts back on 34. Um, but this is what you want from him. Like, I would love to see him get some more gadget work and just easy button, get put the ball in his hands and let him do some work. Um, but nice explosive ability from him. And then, of course, nice protection. Also, maybe a little, little shout out here to James Cook picking up a Landon Roberts and doing just enough to impede him from getting to Josh Allen. And also an off-platform. crazy. <laughs> like, he, Allen throws this from off platform and literally kind of throws it with both feet in the air. Like he is yeah. off the ground throwing this, what five, 10, 15, 20 yards downfield and however many yards outside yeah. um, somebody do the math with the Pythagorean theorem or however you figure <laughs> out the distance on that one. Like that's just, it's a, whenever we talk about mechanics, I'm like, well, he's not making these throws because his mechanics are off. And then he makes a throw like that. And he's like, right. all right, we'll just sit back down and be quiet. Like, And and that's why, again, he was so he was on point. You, whether it was, Inside or outside of structure, whether it was off platform or on platform, he was hitting uh, on pretty much all angles. Uh, <laughs> in again, in this weather, in this cold, with some of those gusts uh, in this game, and this was just again against the blitz. This is you know uh, the Steelers sending the house on that play, and he's able to make that throw down the field late in the play. You know, Diggs did come open later in the route, but he needed to move on because of the pressure that was coming mm -hmm. uh, in into his face. So. Cool. On to the last play of this breakdown. This is our Real Estate Rewind presented by Jonathan Miller of Metro Roberts Realty. And this play by mm. Shakir, 17-yard touchdown. I didn't see it coming, to be honest with you. I did not see it coming. I thought he was going to get wrapped up, and, and the Bills were going to have to eventually kick a field goal here on this drive. And I would have been okay with that. But mm -hmm. this effort was next level and really – won then them the game and once again it was against the blitz it was a five-man pressure that the Steelers sent Josh stood in there they've run this route several times Anthony uh especially when teams want to send the blitz on these second down looks because mm. we've talked about it several times in the film room right and a lot of defenses are treating second down against the Bills oh. as third down because the Bills like to skip third down by going beyond the sticks but here mm -hmm. Josh takes the profit he took the profit with the blitz coming, he hit Shakir quickly, made that quick decision, and that's why Shakir is able to break that tackle and show off some of the his skills that got him drafted by Brandon Bean and the Bills. And he, the first tackle that he breaks is against legitimately one of the best football players on the planet. Not just like defenders, like Minka Fitzpatrick is amazing in every way, shape, and form, and he doesn't miss a lot of tackles. And just look at awesome, awesome freeze frame and pause yeah. right there. Like look at. It looks like he's like got some cardboard underneath him and he's just dancing on the streets of New York, like B boy, <laughs> like break dancing. dancing. Yeah. <laughs> just like playing some beastie boys yeah. or in the eighties, like just doing it. That balance, the ankle flexion, the knee flexion, the, the hip strength, all of it to be able to pull that move off and stay balanced. Then he has the awareness to get up and get up field. And then he turns into a running back with the ball in his hand, something that we mm -hmm. lauded his ability for, um, coming out of Boise state. Like when he gets the ball in his hands and the, Oh, look at that move. That he shakes 38 bro. that, that has he in the moment in the midst of chaos. Like he's not pulling that move in one-on-one -on -one open space. He's pulling that move in the midst of chaos and traffic all in the interior with bodies flying all around him right here, sets it up. You can even see him given that has he puts that left foot into the ground. He gets 38 to break down. Oh, that is absolutely how low. He is too. Bro, his hip, you, you see like that hip fluidity and that flexibility that allows him to make these moves. Then he also breaks a tackle from Cam Hayward, who's trying to run him down. Like this, this play was such a, 
a, a, a big moment for this team. Exactly like you thought. Like I would have been like, okay, it's cool. You get tackled. It's third and seven if they don't get yeah. the first kick the field goal. Just like keep stacking points. But for him to make this play out of nothing, like this is this shows up as like a 20 yard touchdown for Josh Allen, but it's really all due to Khalil Shakir and the run after catch because of his athleticism, the physicality. I tweeted the play out and called him like Khalil Walter Payton Shakir. And just like, just how he <laughs> moved, man. Like, and you can see also too, like the fans loving it, but the players loving it. They wanted to like carry him off into the sunset. Like he was at a wedding, like at a Jewish wedding. And they had him up on the chairs, like carrying him <laughs> off, man. Like that was such a huge play for this team in this moment. Um, and that's why it was our real estate rewind play of the game sponsored, of course, by real estate agent, Jonathan Miller of Metro Roberts Realty. Jonathan uses cutting edge technology to help you sell your home faster. Professional photographs, 3d virtual tour, drone photos, and videos are all included with each listing at no extra charge. He loves working with buyers and sellers in all price ranges. He also donates a portion of his commission uh, from each sale to help rescue an animal. His phone number and contact information can be found in our episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform you're listening to this show on yeah and we talked about the effort from shakir we talked about you know the uh quick decision by josh but you know let's talk about from the shoulders up you see right there josh knows the blitz is coming he's mm -hmm. calling out that the defender is coming off of the slot there he saw it and even spencer brown saw it too and he pointed it out right there so they know that they have an extra rusher coming out there and it's important because they gotta have you can see torrance he's already looking out there so mm -hmm. you're gonna have right here these guys are going to slide out that way, and they're going to pick up that guy, and that allows Josh to, uh, once again, boom, get rid of the ball. So very good pickup uh, from Josh in the offensive line there, allowing the ball to get out to Shakir so that they could showcase these skills. And it th it's the reason why this is the Real Estate Rewind. Mm -hmm. We had to see it several times, especially when you talk about that contact balance from Shakir. Just <sighs> filthy, just filthy stuff. I can't believe he kept his, his balance there. It's very, very running back, like as you talked about, man. I don't know if I'm more impressed with the initial flexibility and balance to get out of the Fitzpatrick tackle and keep your feet and then still go, or if it's the move later, like all of it was just beautiful. He keeps having these moments. Like he's not pulling out like, you know, 10 catches for 150 yards. Right. Every week is like, you know, three for 36 or like three for 70 or something, but he makes these big plays either big in terms of the moment or big in terms of the yards generated like he did against Miami. Oh, the week before on that little bubble, like he just continues to show up with these high EPA generating plays and big moments and big mm -hmm. games. He's become a real clutch performer. And again, that coming against the blitz, like you said, um, and just put a little bow on that with the blitz numbers. Yeah. Allen was blitzed on 52.9% of dropbacks. He was 11 of 16, 119 yards, two touchdowns, a rating of 129.9, and then two little nuggets that are important. So again, he had 11 completions, eight of them went for first downs and he was sacked on zero of the blitz attempts from the Steelers. And that's because he was playing on time, playing in rhythm. He was getting the ball out. He was taking the profit. Like we like to say all the time. And that's when he's gotten himself in trouble in the past, not taking the profit, not staying on schedule yeah. and staying ahead of the sticks. He did that right from the jump in this game. And it made a big difference for the offense. And guys like Shakir and guys like cook are going to play important roles versus Spagnolo and this chiefs de oh. defense this coming week. When they do send pressure, when they do, disguise that pressure and send those blitzes those guys are going to have to be in lockstep you heard Shakir in the presser after the game talk about that play and how he's running that shallow across the middle of the field but he's getting his eyes to the quarterback quickly mm -hmm. in case there is pressure and so those type of situations are going to be very important the issues that the bills have run into when teams have blitzed and they've affected the quarterback and you know we saw it um prior to the the last two games those issues arose when they didn't see the blitz coming and the receivers and the quarterback didn't weren't on the same page of, Hey, I need a site adjustment. Hey, your route is the hot route. I need you looking at me immediately. And so that's when those issues arose. And so that'll be super important in this game. Guys like Shakir, guys like cook have to be in lockstep with Josh when the chiefs send the pressure, whether it's a blitz or just a simulated or creeper pressure, when they have that free runner, there has to be someone available for a hot route or a site adjustment, and that'll be important this weekend against the Chiefs. Absolutely. It, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be paramount. Steve Spagnuolo, his ability to disguise coverage, to disguise pressure, to dial up pressure, it's one of his calling cards, if not his biggest calling card, and it's the reason why even when the Chiefs statistically are like a horrible defense, by the time they get into the playoffs – 
he's such a good playoff defensive coordinator, big game mm-hmm. defensive coordinator because of his ability to pinpoint your weaknesses and just do crazy stuff on defense. I mean, everybody in their mother was showing the clip um, from last week against Miami with the little ring around safeties, the rosy with the safeties. Like, yeah, it's too yeah. high, and then it's single, and then it's two, yeah. and then it's man. Like everything that they're doing, he just gets into a bunch of different stuff. And even just aside, so you have that, which is tough enough. And then you've got Chris Jones and you've got the mm-hmm. Sneed and you've got Trent McDuffie and these dudes that are playing at high levels. And then good role players like Karloftis and Amenehu, like mm-hmm. it's a tall task to go against this defense. It's the reason they're, you know, so much of the conversation has been around, you know, the, um, the, the chiefs offense and what's wrong with them. And while the chiefs run defense isn't great as a defense as a whole, they're seventh in DVOA fifth against the pass fourth in EPA per pass allowed third in positive play percentage against the pass second in success rate against the pass fifth in DVOA versus wide receiver ones. Again, leading to that Stefan Diggs piece mm-hmm. it, it, they're, they're a quality unit. And in similar to, we, I don't know, talked about it coming out of multiple losses this year for the bills. If you get into third and long or third and predictable situations, like you did against the Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm going to continue to go to that. Well, yeah. and allowed the Jags to get in and called well to get into his bag as a blitzer and pressure dial up guy. It's going to be the same thing with Kansas city. They're going to play into that hand. Spags mm-hmm. is going to get into his bag. No, no pun intended with the rhyme there or joke intended there. You cannot yeah. let, Spagnolo have that chess match advantage against you. And the way to do that is to stay ahead of schedule. Also run the ball a little bit, yeah. but if you get that precision, Josh Allen, it's a really big neutralizer for this chief's defense. I'm so excited. I'm so excited about this game, man. Like I don't want it to be here quite yet because I still want to dive in some more, but mm. I'm so excited to see Mahomes come to Orchard park and high Mark oh. stadium and the chiefs come into town. And for the you know their first time on the road, really, um, yes, in, in a first long true time. road playoff. Yeah, game. Like the yeah, only road, man. the only road games they've had have been the Super Bowls that are at neutral site, which is unreal. Like that's that they never the fact that the chips always fall where they're either the one seed or the seeds ahead of them lose, so they're mm-hmm. always home. Like it's just ridiculous. It's worked out beautifully for them. So the Bills, they went on their run. They snagged that two seed. They get into the playoffs. They beat down on a Steelers team that they should be. And they do it by, you know, Josh and that offense and, and, you know, really having some high efficiency plays, but getting some of those explosives, spreading the ball around. Yes. They had injuries on defense, but you had McDermott scheming his mind out, right? Like yep. this has been a good run and this is the test. You have to beat the best. And I'm so excited for this matchup on Sunday. And we appreciate everyone joining us tonight to kind of move forward, put the Steelers game behind us, but move forward. Uh, for the Chiefs game this week, we appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Yeah, I'm I'm super geeked up and but also anxious and nervous. I'm not gonna lie too. Like as soon as I saw that it was like the 6:30 game, I was like, oh, another divisional round game against the Chiefs at 6:30, just like the 13 seconds game. Like fantastic. But so many things have lined up from like a storybook perspective yeah. with everything the Bills have been through in the last calendar year, That's let great. alone. Yep, exactly. Like just, <laughs> and then, so that, and then just with everything in this previous off season and into the regular season. And now, yeah, mm-hmm. for it to line up where Mahomes and the chiefs finally got to come to your house and you mm-hmm. get the chance to kill the dragon and slay them on the road. Like this team that has just always had your number in the playoffs. I can't imagine how rowdy, the like the stadium's gonna be like everybody is gonna be rocking like just for yeah. the hatred and imagine imagine if Taylor Swift is there everybody's gonna dial it up even more like she yeah. honestly like she probably shouldn't come like it's not safe for her there yeah. like you should I do not worry do a that. little bit <laughs> yeah like and it it's just gonna be an awesome atmosphere and even aside from the Bills fan perspective and our Chiefs fan perspective schematically who these two teams are. And it's that old adage, um, you know, styles make fights Mm -hmm. and the styles of the chiefs and bills are the reason why every time they have a matchup and each one of their fights are so memorable, regular or postseason, And to know how much is on the line in this game. And then depending on what happens with Baltimore the night before, maybe Houston does something crazy and beats Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And the winner of the chiefs bills is hosting the AFC championship game against Houston. Like, or there's just so many, Oh, I'm just, I'm, I got goosebumps thinking about it, man. I'm and so and kind of like how we started the show, just take a moment to, you know, let it all sink in this matchup of Mahomes versus Allen, because these are the matchups years down the line. When Allen retires, when the Mahomes is gone, we're going to look back at like the Peyton Manning versus Tom Brady. Good call. Like these matchups are, are fun in the moment, 
but you also got to understand that like these are memorable historical moments that not only Bills and Chiefs fans want to see, but the entire NFL has been waiting for this moment. So as you said, the scripts, it's beautiful. The narratives are there and you're going to have a good call. You know, some of the, the broadcasters are going to have good guys calling that. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. I'm excited. And, uh, you know, we'll get into some more content as the week goes on. But thanks for joining us, guys. This has been fun this entire year. And obviously, this won't be our last film room. Hopefully, there's a few more. Yes, fingers crossed and every other superstitious thing possible to uh, make sure. But regardless of what happens this weekend, we will have you covered in the film room next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, as always, in our regularly scheduled time. So I'm then going forward for whatever happens this offseason, whether it's Senior Bowl stuff, draft content, free agency pieces, we will be rolling every single week here. This train does not stop um, on the film room. And like Eric said, yeah, we appreciate everybody for tuning in tonight on this Wednesday after the Buffalo Bills advanced in the wild card round against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we put a bow on that game. And like Eric said, yeah, uh, head over to Twitter as the rest of this week goes through, whether it's at cover one um, at cover and the number one or myself at pro underscore underscore and or Eric's personal account at Eric J Turner. We'll have you covered with more advanced metrics, film clips of the bills, Kansas city chief stuff, more things to really kind of, get everybody full circle and in lockstep going forward uh, for this important division around game against the chiefs. Thank you to everyone who joined us live here on this episode. We greatly appreciate you folks. Thank you very much for the kind words coming through in the chat. Now, thank you very much yeah. to Nathan and Sophia and Carl for your super chats tonight. We are greatly appreciative of those and thankful for those. If you are still here before you leave, please, please, please. And thank you. Drop a like on this video. It goes to say a sincerely long way towards helping us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. Likes are the lifeblood of these streams and the algorithm and everything. So please drop a like on this video if you have not already. If you are watching later, that's cool too. Thank you very much for your post-live view. Please drop a like on this video. If you are listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms, that's awesome. Please rate and review and subscribe to the Cover One Film Room on whichever platform you are listening to this show on. Turn on notifications for the Cover One Film Room uh, playlist here on YouTube and subscribe to the Cover One channel as a whole. We have you covered every single day of the week with anything and everything Buffalo Bills, differing levels of analysis and entertainment pieces, whatever you're looking for, we have you covered here at the brand. And that'll do it for us here in this episode of the Cover One Film Room. As always, I'm Anthony Prohaska. That's Eric Turner. We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. If you live in Buffalo, hope you were dealing well with the snowstorm and everything that yeah, came through safe. again today. Yeah, North Towns got hit. South Towns got hit. Wherever you live, uh, everybody got covered in snow again. So hope you and yours are all doing well. If you're going to the game on Sunday, man, make it tough for the Chiefs. Be responsible. Be smart. Be safe. Have a great time. We will see you next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, for another episode of The Film Room. But until then, Godspeed, and as always, go Bills.